I'm a libertarian. What I'm getting is... Did why? you vote for Joe Jorgensen or Trump? Who? Joe the, Jorgensen. That was the perfect answer. Thank you. And welcome, everybody, to the Libertarian Podcast Review. Let's see if I get this right. Uh, we review podcasts. Today, we're going to talk to a, a person, a, a, a host of a podcast himself, Patrick McFarlane. He is the host of the Libertarian or the Liberty Weekly Podcast. He's an attorney. He's also a contributor at the Libertarian Institute, father, husband, and he's doing some things in local politics. I thought we would talk to him about uh, most of, likely I'm interested in the, uh, the, the attorney stuff. Though. So Patrick, welcome. And thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah. First, why don't we just talk a little bit about uh, your podcast? And I do have some things I want to talk to you about specifically. But let's start with your podcast. You've been going on since what? I, I look back here and it looks like it's been since about 2017 and you started with a friend at that point. So why don't you give us a rundown of your podcast, kind of where it even uh, emanated from. And then um, I've got a bunch of other things we want to talk about. Cool. Yeah. So I think it was Memorial Day of 2017 is when I launched it. And um, I had been blogging at libertyweekly.net for, uh, I don't know, maybe a year, six months or something like that. So when it happened, I was in law school and I started, I had a summer job after my first year of law school. And I remember binging Tom Woods during that time. So I was working like in, in the alumni relations department and I had nothing but time because it was just data entry. So I would listen to podcasts and get my like libertarian cred and that background info. But I've been a libertarian for a really long time since high school. And I discovered Ron Paul in undergrad. I was part of Young Americans for Liberty. And I kind of came in in the crater of 2012. And I just found these ideas. And I, I remember reading Anatomy of the State for the first time. And I remember that just really rocking my world. And it was my buddy, Jerry, who actually turned me on to all this stuff. Because he was my roommate senior year in college. We lived in like an animal house kind of situation. <laughs> so he... He just kind of really gently held my feet to the fire with these because he knew he had a, a, a foot in with the libertarian arguments. And so he just kind of drilled it down like Larkin Rose style. Uh, you know, have you have you heard of Larkin Rose candles in the dark? Yes, I have. So that's now, the, I'll, I'll just say, by the way, um, I'm a fan of yours. I've watched a bunch of stuff, which has also led me to Keith Knight. And you guys collaborated on a lot of stuff. And Keith introduced me to a litany of people, uh, one of them, Larkin Rose, and I did see some of his stuff. Now, I haven't purchased any of his books or whatnot, but I am very aware. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah. And so, yeah, so he did that to me and it kind of planted that splinter in my mind that I had to work out because I think it works with people who care about consistency. Right. You know? oh, yeah. And so I, I kind of worked that out and then I just, I went through like an evangelical phase, which is what I call it and what jerry called it was when you're really excited about these ideas and you just want to tell everyone about it and you annoy the hell out of everyone and right. so i i wanted to start the podcast and the blogging as an outlet for me to express that energy in a productive way and not like torture my friends and family with it but it didn't work so so you're still torturing him is what you're saying yes although i i like to think i'm a little better at it now you know, that's a that's so remnant. Uh, I feel the same because, well, I have a another podcast I've done for years, probably about the same this time as you. It's on cycling. It's bike racing. I do all that. Nice. But I get really big into politics and my transformation, you know, in the 2016 era, uh, moving from the right to li full on libertarian to ANCAP. Um, I didn't know how I felt about necessarily, and I pushed some of these ideas, little kernels of them, but not so much. So I started this and I don't necessarily push it anywhere but like my twitter world you know like the local family and stuff they know a little bit but they do get annoyed yeah my wife um it she's she's a saint with this you know she's very patient but i i can't lie and say that everything's been you know that there haven't been any waves with the podcast you know it's like uh, especially since we started with the libertarian institute um, at least that helps pay the bills a little bit. And so it's not like I'm completely wasting my time or, or, you know, like not wasting my time, but investing time in something that doesn't really give I me know. much. Yeah. I, Especially I, being I, an attorney where my time is valuable. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's same here. You know, I I, I do things what I I told you. You know, I just do an intro and I post it so that it's it's streamlined to really cut down on my editing because those are bill up for me. Those are billable hours, right? And <laughs> you're like, how much did I just spend on on this little hobby that I have? Uh, tell me about the Libertarian Institute. So, um, like I said, I've I've listened to your show actually for several years, and I've gone back and listened to things you know several years ago, uh, and I know you took like some time off, uh, but you got connected with the Libertarian Institute as well. How did that? come about of, of connecting with them. And I'm really glad to hear that you're getting some um, funds, for, um, some money for doing that too. Yeah. And that's a recent development. And I have to say, um, we started our fall fundraiser. And the only reason that's possible is because people give to the Institute. Otherwise, right. I'd still be doing it, but it, you know, uh, headway that ways. But um, I actually don't even remember. I remember coming across the Libertarian Institute I remember that I didn't realize that Scott was the director of the Libertarian Institute. And so even like I had Scott on the show one time and it was the first time I interviewed him or spoke with him at all. And uh, I said, yeah, well, I, I don't know if you know who I am. Like I'm Patrick McFarlane. I do this show. And he's like, yeah, like you wouldn't be on the Libertarian Institute if I didn't know who you were or if I didn't green light it. So I was just like, oh, wow. So I've been on the I've been on the institute for a few like two or three years now, um, so the institute is Scott's institute. He started it, and um, I don't exactly know because Keith came into the institute at a certain time. So I don't know. I guess is the best question or the uh, best answer. Really memorable. Um, yeah. So being so uh, with your podcast, you took some time off. Was that anything to do with? And then it seems like now you've once you've come back, you've really not just come back into it, but you've really ramped it up. Yeah. So um, you're getting paid with that. Are you a practicing attorney? Are you doing mostly podcasts, a little bit of both? And um, what was your impetus for really pushing your your content when you came back? Um, well, so the, the reason I, I took off was because I had my first child, or my wife did rather, and we, I was in doing personal injury litigation at that point on the plaintiff's side. And it was really time intensive. I, I'm talking like, I don't know, 55 hours a week, nearing 60. And I really needed to focus on, you know, my family and work at that time. So that didn't really uh, pan out for too long with my old firm. And then so I left the firm and I got a job at a title company. And so now I'm one of the attorneys for the company. And we, we advise the closers and all those things on the real estate transactions and and help to facilitate like commercial deals and stuff like that. So it's a nine to five and it it's a good deal for me and my family in terms of that. So that allows me to do, you know, podcasts every night for the most part after the kids go to bed. Do, do you, did you enjoy the uh, personal injury side or do you enjoy this more? And, and let me just put this out there as well. What would be your ideal kind of practicing law? Um, so ideally... I guess ideally I'd be working for like a nonprofit doing um, doing papers like the Cato Institute foreign policy section or 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 being like a commentator like that or writing policy papers and doing analysis that way. Um, if I was a litigation attorney, I would love to be doing civil rights work. Hmm. Um, there's there's an organization in Wisconsin called the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. And there's some cool stuff that they do, although they're a bit Republican-ish, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so I think that'd be my ideal situation for sure. So so what got you into law in the first place? I mean, you said that you were a libertarian in high school, which is yeah. unique, I think, to some extent. Um, I've always, I was on the right, but I've always had this libertarian bent, you know, very well understood, you know, Bastiat, it was kind of my in ingrained there. Um, but what got you into, first of all, doing, going to law school? And then, um, did you have, did you take those thoughts and those, uh, those, those convictions and principles into the classroom with you? I took my right wing ones and I look back now and I'm kind of like, I, I think I had some, I have some better arguments now, but did you, uh, did you have some good law school arguments as well? Yeah, I think so. So my, my mom is a lawyer. And so that certainly had a lot of influence on me. And I think really the reason I became a lawyer is because I was an English major in undergrad and all of a sudden I was graduating and my focus was in creative writing and I never thought that I'd ever have a chance to publish. 
and be an author, which is what I really wanted to do. And so I took kind of the safe route and I went to law school. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, I don't know. I've always kind of questioned my decision to become a lawyer. Oh. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer. You know, it's like every when I was starting to go into law school, everyone I talked to about it was like, don't do it. Like, just don't. And that pissed me off. So, of course, I went and I did it. Right. And yeah. Uh, one of my, my uh, brother-in-law, his dad uh, is a dentist, and he always tells me the same story over and over. He went to some friend's uh, law school graduation, and the guy that gave the speech for the graduation gave a speech about 90, 99 things to do as an attorney, and none of them were practicing law. Yeah. So I, the good thing about being an attorney, it gives you a way of thinking, and I think it's probably, and then your, your creative writing with your English, uh, it's probably served you well for what you're doing now. And I think just the problem solving, you know, you mentioned earlier about, uh, for me, this is the greatest thing about libertarianism is the consistency aspect of it, right? You get, you're kind of broken away from those two uh, teams that you're always getting pulled in different directions and having to argue against stuff. You know, you see this on on Twitter, like, you know, posting the L's, these people that are I'm like taking the Trump vaccine and now they're, you know, forcing on you. So the yeah. consistency side. And so has you, have you taken this law into the podcasting and really been able to um, flourish with it? I mean, do you feel that that's a, a plus? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's make it feel better about being an attorney. Yeah. No, well, I appreciate it. It's, I mean, to, to be honest, and I've been pretty honest and personal with my audience is like, I, I've, it's been a really tough few years for me and my family, you know, and um, I certainly have been able to use it. I, I thought once I first got into the podcasting game, I thought that being an attorney would give me a niche that I didn't see very much um, in podcasting. But of course, when I started my show, there were there were a lot of libertarian podcasts, but it wasn't like it is right now. Um, right. It's there's a lot, and not that's not a bad thing necessarily, but. Uh, yeah, it has helped me, I think, in some of the specific content that I've done. But I've always let my own interests guide what the what the episodes are about. No, I understand. I, but, you know, you just did a deep dive into the, the Uyghur situation yeah. and some of these other ones that are uh, a little bit more intensive. And you're, I was just thinking about you doing them and um, just your probably your ability to organize, line things up, make the arguments themselves. And, you know, it's probably been helpful. You know, uh, just on a side note, um, I don't know if you've seen the Joe Rogan, uh, Dr. Uh, Gupta um, discussion or debate. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Um, I, I, you did see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I watched it today too. And it actually reminded me of the Scott Horton, Bill Crystal, And maybe we can talk about that as well, where I felt Joe, you know, this is what's amazing. Like, you know, as an attorney, we're out there, we're making our arguments and you're, you're always thinking, then you watch someone like Joe just have a conversation or Dave Smith does this quite often. And then, you know, Scott Horton did too, where you're like, as an attorney, you're like, wow, that's, that's impressive. I thought Joe set him up early by saying, Hey, remember when you changed your mind about marijuana? Remember how great that was that you had new facts. Yeah. And then remember how the media is lying to you at, at the time. Wasn't that horrible? Now let's talk about COVID. And I think he just like set him up and it was, it was quite brilliant. What would you think of the interview itself? So I, I have to to correct myself. I watched the highlight where he okay. confronts Gupta about ivermectin. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was great. And the fact that, I mean, Joe Rogan's audience is dwarf CNN's audience on any yeah. given day. And so it was kind of encouraging to me to get someone from the mainstream media called out and for so many people to see it, but also for people to see that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, that all of these talking heads, Bill Crystal included, is cannot face up against you know one of our guys. It's right. just crazy. So, so let's talk about the uh, the Bill Crystal uh, situation. I, I saw you guys um, on what is it, Conflicts of Interest podcast. Yeah, yeah. I said uh, I saw a few little. You guys are throwing out some highlights. So I was getting ready the other day. I was just watching some of those, um, and I know you had made the comment about Bill Crystal not really being prepared. Um, you want to go into that a little bit and and um, Maybe your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so Bill Crystal, he his importance in propagating the terror wars, I don't think it can be overstated. And the fact that, you know, he he's justified all these interventions and he didn't ever see an intervention that he didn't like, I, I think is it's just incredible. It's an incredible opportunity for Scott to get to really go to bat against 
one of the greatest architects of the the post 9-11 era in our foreign policy. And I, I think it was Bill Crystal. He was the editor or started the Weekly Standard, and he had it delivered to everyone in the White House um, on their staff. It was delivered to them. So um, really just surprising that Bill can't remember the arguments that he made in the past, can't remember the interventions that he supported, and didn't have a command of the facts like you would expect him to. It's almost like, I don't know if you're a UFC fan, but Ronda Rousey winning the title and then she got so focused on being a star that she forgot yeah. that she was a fighter. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't even know if Bill Crystal was ever the title, you know, carrier, I guess, I, to make the analogy. Well, what was interesting about it too was you've got you've got well and and so one of the things that Bill emphasizes at his finish is, you know, hey, it's not, you don't need to take pot shots. I'm just kind of, I'm dumbing it down here. You don't need to be taking pot shots at this thing, you know, and we can, you can have a civil debate. And if you're not being civil about this debate, maybe, you know, you don't deserve to win. That's kind of what he was inferring. But because my thought was that Scott really went after him personally. But, you know, you say, was, was, was he Ronda Rousey like? Well, I mean, he was very, very prominent in pushing a lot of these things. And his magazine was, so I think Scott taking him personally, taking on him personally, um, was significant and it was uh, it was warranted. Um, but he did come out and say he was anti-war at the end. Yeah, well, I I, I think it was interesting because um, you know we had a meeting with we had a Libertarian Institute staff meeting a few weeks before the debate, and Sheldon was talking to Scott and saying basically like, you know, hey, focus on the question, don't go after Bill personally, and and. What we saw was Scott going after the question and not going after yeah. Bill personally. Um, and and I thought I thought it was pretty effective, although I, I think you know Scott said on Tom Wood's show that Tom uh, Tom and someone else um, was telling Scott to go for the throat, basically. Um, so I'm sorry, I forgot the question. Oh, I'm just just uh, I don't even remember myself. Right, but so I mean, Scott was going after him, and just Bill. I, I think it was kind of like showing your belly. Um, you know, when two animals are fighting in the wild, and one of them shows their belly for mercy, it's it's like, hey man, look, I got nothing, but you were dirty. Yeah, no, and, and it's not Scott's fault if all of Bill's uh, everything that he said and supported was sounded genocidal. You know. Yeah, that's the facts. I, it was uh, to me it was the more interesting part wasn't necessarily Scott's rebuttal because if you've listened to Scott, you knew it was going to be this, you know, just lambasting of facts and reasons and just progression down. It was more interesting to hear Bill and Bill just kept saying over and over the same little platitudes without any kind of really supporting facts. And you know, I, how do you feel about the voting for a debate like that? Because it's I mean, even Scott had admitted it's kind of rigged in a sense. I mean, he, when he gets seventy some percent to start. You kind of know you're already, you know, it, I don't know. What did you think about that? It seems like a formality to me, you know. Uh, I'm sure I, because I had actually paid tickets to go see it and I was going to go see it, but I wasn't about to get the vaccine to go see it. So, um, yeah, I watched it live. I didn't register for the voting, but if I were to register to the voting, I would have said I was undecided and then switched yeah. my vote at the end. So, Right. But I think it's a great symbolic victory for sure, and I think yeah. that's important. I, when you talked about um, Ronda Rousey, my my thought was kind of so. I went to uh, grad school to, at uh, University of Colorado, okay. and our big football team at the time, our it was in the late nineties, uh, mid nineties. Uh, our big rivalry was University of Nebraska, though they didn't know that we were the rival. I mean, oh, right. it's precious, you know. But for us, it was a big deal every time. And it kind of made me think of this, and not not to put down Scott being Nebraskan. I mean, to be Colorado in the sense, you know, where he's going up against um, Bill Crystal, and so our fans show up, and we're ready for this because we know he's got the. And and I don't think Bill Crystal cares that this happened. I don't think that it's going to change his, you know, anything about him that this happened. He was just annoyed that it happened. Yeah, I think you're totally right. Yeah, and. The, the I think the other victory to it is, you know, not not as many people who should see it will see it. Yeah. And um, just the fact that, I mean, this is a defining moment for the modern anti-war movement because other figures in the anti-war movement saw what Scott did. 
and and as divided as the anti-war movement is and has been um that moment for you know a lot of figures like caitlin johnstone for one of them saw it and is cheering scott on so it's like it, as divi- as divided as the libertarian movement is it seems to me that the anti-war movement is more divided and more easily divided I think this might be a, a chance, though, like watch the numbers on this video, you know, in the next few years, it might be one of these situations where, um, you know, you can show someone, hey, uh, Bill Crystal, this, he was a big proponent of this. This is how he's thinking about it now. He can't defend it. And when he does, he tries to, you know, oh, you're, you're, you're just, you know, this peon that's, that's being mean to me. So it might, I, I think it might be one of those things that you, know, you look back later and you can see it as this kind of seminal moment. At least that's a hope. But um, I don't know. What's what's uh, any lasting impressions of the of the debate? I'm just really proud of Scott and what he's been able to do. I mean, this was a real. This was this was I I don't like antiwar.com and the legacy that Justin, uh, you know, of Justin Raimondo and all the people who named the neocons as it was happening. Yeah. The the chance for antiwar.com to be able to swing against Bill Crystal is just immense. And and I there's no overstating that. No, very true. So you had mentioned the uh, not getting a vaccine to you know to to go there and watch it. Um, you want to tell some people kind of about what your situation, what you're doing there in Wisconsin. I I was fascinated with and and really inspired. Not that I'm going to do anything about it. I might. Yeah. Um, I'm in California, out by Sacramento. Um, you know, my community is just it kind of in the, started to be in the foothills, and you see such big differences. I mean, the county line from Sacramento to El Dorado is, you know, just about a quarter mile from me. And, you know, one is wide open, one's not. It's just so weird how COVID doesn't cross county lines. Right. But what you did out there and your, your conversation about, I would, and I'll try to maybe put that link in the show notes here. Um, it's really inspiring for what you did. Why don't you talk us, to us a little bit about what your plan is and what you've done. And, and then I, I just wanted to, one quick comment before I forget here, you know, go to law school, you start to, you know, I don't know if you were able to do a lot of court time in your, your years of practice, or if you do, uh, I do family law. So I'm in there like constantly, um, but public. And so it feels like you're doing public speaking, but you said you spoke to like 300, 200, 300 people. How was that? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll start with what I'm doing. Um, I did get some, I, I got a bit of court time and I, I law clerked in law school at the public defender's office. So I was able to get some time public speaking, but yeah, it was totally different. And I thought that my skills as a podcaster would kind of come through a bit. Uh, and they did. I mean, they did, but I, I read a speech. I didn't have anything memorized or go impromptu or extemporaneous or anything like that. But so, well, essentially what I did is I'm in deep red Wisconsin. I'm in a pretty very rural part of Wisconsin. And I know how people in this county feel. I, I grew up in this county. I went to high school here. I know people. Um, this is a deep red county. But our leadership in this county is is progressive. And you wonder how the hell that happens. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But it, it seems like, here. here's an aside, as a lawyer, these representatives don't understand separation of powers because they they think that what's constitutional is whatever the legislature tells them is constitutional. And it, it's just like they don't understand that they themselves have a policy position to play here. Hmm. So they they just need to they need to nullify this stuff. They need to follow their oath to the constitution and then let the courts sort it out. That's what they need to do. But as an aside, um I got sick of this and, and Biden's vaccine mandate came down. I'm in a position where the company has more than a hundred employees and nothing has happened yet on it, but I just figured I'm not going to roll over and die. And there's no way that I am going to get the vaccine. There's no way I'm going to be treated like a second class citizen and I'm not going to be tested and I'm not paying for testing. And so what I did is I decided to have an event to try to make some noise. And I texted someone who owns a supper club bar around here who I know felt the same way. And I asked if we could set up some kind of an event. And so I text, I created a poster for the event. I confirmed it with him. He said, hell yes. And I texted it to him and I did nothing else. And the word of mouth spread like wildfire throughout the county. 
And the night of the event, we had maybe 300 people show up. The sheriff showed up. Uh, some members of the school board and the county board showed up. And I gave a 10-minute speech, and people seemed to really like it. And um, so we have five more venues that want me to come speak across. And it's not just in this county. It's uh, in across, you know, in the area. And um, so that's really exciting. But one thing that I think really resonated with people is that I attacked the right from the right. And I said, you know, hey, we're supposed to believe in this shit. Sorry. I don't know if you. No, drop fine. This. I don't. You guys are supposed to believe in this shit. So why don't we act like it? And this is a very dire situation. And this is maybe the struggle of our lifetimes. I, I sincerely believe that. And so talking about nullification and, and, and libertarians are the best people to spread this message because we're the best at this. We're yeah. the best on every position and people have not heard our stance on these things. We like to think that people have, uh, but they really haven't. And I think that when we present it to them in, you know, an articulate and well-reasoned way that they identify with it because it's what they really believe. They just don't know it. What did you give some uh, common uh, ideas? I know you're not, you're not, you know, going to stand up there and get legal, legal advice, but I mean, for these kind of things, you could give some really common examples and, and processes about how to nullify some situation, you know, some of these laws. And um, in, on that same vein, have you looked into this? Because look, okay, I'm an NCAP. I assume you are as well, that vein here. Uh, and now there's the big debate about, you know, are you living in an NCAP stand in your head? That's Pete's big deal, of course. Um, and then so, which would make, maybe make you think of, uh, we don't even need to an analyze these situations. Have you analyzed this, you know, mandate from on high with Biden as far as legally going and how that works for me? You know, I look at it from the, what, the Jacobson v. Massachusetts thing of um, 1905, and I see it as a much different story. But have you looked into that? And then maybe what were your uh, comments to the crowd about uh, nullification? So the, the thing I've actually looked at legally just has been the Wisconsin Department of Health's authority to quarantine people. And specifically, there's a problem in this county where the uh, the county public health department is quarantining close contacts of school children. So uh, the school board and the school district will be quarantining people with without due process. They get a letter from the health department saying, you know, hey, so when Susie said that you were with, you know, Bill and Bill tested positive. And uh, so you were exposed and now you have to quarantine. So I was looking at their their authority to do that. And they seems like they might have the authority under DHS code 145. Um, so that's the extent of what I've analyzed. I have looked at Jacobson. I've read Jacobson. Um, but then again, Jacobson provides a fine, a payment of a fine a one-time payment. So those are some of the things that I've looked at. In terms of nullification, it's it's been really hard, I'll tell you, to, to try and define what exactly constitutes legal advice in this context. I play it very safe. But you have people coming to you and they're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be fired. What can I do? Or, you know, hey, my kid got quarantined and I'm just going to send her to school. What What should I do? Or Hey, does the, does the health department really have the authority to quarantine my son? He's not sick, and I I'm just like, hey, you know, I I um I've been trying to refer these people to lawyers that will take their case because I'm not in a position to litigate these cases right now. Yeah, and it's probably best to you know get get the ideas out there. I think we, it was really impressive for me, kind of your um your angle, which was going after the school quarantine. I mean, for me here in California, I have four kids, two in college, two in high school, and they are, the the, the, the school, uh, the U teachers union is the most powerful union in the state. Sure. So, you know, you want to talk about um, trying to, okay, so maybe the county doesn't want to do something, but the state is then going to run the school board and they're going to just railroad them. So your, your mode and your way of thinking about it uh, starts to have my wheels going too as well. You know, about the Jacobson thing, I, I mean, I think this is why you haven't had Biden really push forward on this and he just throw, floats it out there and then he's have uh, businesses taken off is because that was a state issue. 
Right. You know, the state has police power and he's doing a federal thing and the fed, feds don't have the police power that they could uh, just don't see it as as the same aspect and even uh, being able to to do that there at the time they struck some things down and then they I don't remember in total but um it was that to me was the big crux of it was the difference of the federal and the state and the two different authorities that they had. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right. And um it, I mean rhetorically an arguing point against the Jacobson case is the case that it spawned which is you know it's it's the uh what are they uh it's it's the embarrassment of constitutional law professors everywhere is the buck v bell case uh yeah is the i don't remember it but i remember the name it, so buck v bell is the mandatory sterilization case oh yeah of the unfit and so um who is that that one professor uh, oliver wendell holmes jr wrote famously like three generations of imbeciles is enough. And <laughs> right. I, I think that the vaccination issue is, is actually very analogous to mandatory sterilization. Um, I, I think just because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a gross invasion of personal pro of, you know, self-ownership. Um, someone who doesn't want to get a vaccine, I, I guess there's an argument that the vaccine won't outright like kill you. Uh, but you object to it on moral grounds, whereas sterilization is the same. Like they're taking something from you, they're invading your body, and I guess it won't kill you, right? We don't know. That's right. kind of if you watch the whole Joe Rogan thing. He keeps hammering on. Uh, well, we don't know. You know, like young boys the testing. Where's the testing for this? Right. So I guess you could argue that vaccination is even more of, um, you know, a bodily invasion. Right, right. Uh, so, with your with your speech that you had there, and you're you're, you're now getting contacted by other uh, bars, or I guess <laughs> um, yeah. other locales to to do this. Uh, what's been any uh, pushback with that, or has it mostly been a positive? It's mostly been positive, although I'm I was told through the grapevine that the um, the public health czar, I call her in our county, uh, was not very happy about my first meeting when she heard about it. But I think that's more because she was afraid that there were so many people in one place at one time, which I haven't heard that anyone got COVID from the event. So, um, yeah, so I, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback. I've gotten a lot, a lot of positive feedback. People really appreciative that someone is doing something about it. And in a way, that's kind of frustrating because my message was no one's going to save you. You need to save yourself and you need to stop waiting around for someone to come and tell you what to do. Right. So, um, no, but it's been great. And I think that if I were, um, well, I'm certainly going to keep going with this. We have more events planned, um, but it certainly is making a name for me in the, in the community. And it's something I didn't really think about before I made the decision to do this. For me, I mean, I, I have my own law firm, so I'm really not at this point, I'm not planning on working for anybody else ever. So, um, you know, people want to come after me. It's I am the HR department. I mean, yeah. my, my law partner, I think he kind of knows my feelings, but he's okay with it. So it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And I, I, I won't say I'll never practice like litigate again. You know, there's a possibility if things get harried with my job that I would probably start my own firm. I'm done working for other people, I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in, in a legal litigations, you know, mm. in, in a legal litigation firm kind of thing. I just have not had great experiences with lawyers I've worked for. Why is that? What, what was the, uh, the downfall? Um, it was different at each one, but it, it, I just, I find that lawyers only care about themselves. Right. And, and they, they're, they'll throw you under the bus. It seems like if it means saving their own ass. Or even yeah. inconveniencing themselves. It's so it's so interesting. Like um, one of the things for me, we have a small firm, like six, two attorneys, and you know several paralegals and stuff. But uh, you know, one of my first things coming in, I came into law later in life. But uh, first thing, you know, I've just been I'm a nice guy, and sometimes you have to deal with clerks. And you know, if it's so interesting to see an attorney, you know, just try to run over them because he's an attorney or she. Yeah. Uh, but my whole thing with them has always been, or the, the person at the front desk uh, or the, the the bailiffs or what have you is you act like you, they are the the ultimate and you're just trying to, Hey, I'm just need a little bit of help. And you know, you like succumb to them in a sense. Um, and they will 
give you the world. <laughs> you can yeah. get all kinds of things done. But a lot of attorneys aren't that way because it's their ego takes over. And it's, it's just it's exactly what you said. So they're willing to step on on, on their associates too. And I, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. You know, and um, I, I think the writing was on the wall with my old firm, just ideologically, they are very progressive. And when COVID hit, they wanted to go fully remote. And I was like, I, I just, I can't practice that way. I just can't. And and I think I tried to make it work, but it just ultimately didn't work. That's uh, that's interesting. So I, here in California, when, yeah, COVID hit, um, everything went remote, the courts shut down. And that's kind of my, especially as I said, family law, that's your, that's how you're making your money. Oh yeah. Court. So, uh, but now everything's except for in-person trials now, but everything's Zoom. And, and to some extent, it's actually better. I mean, I'm much more efficient. I can just go into my office, zoom in, sometimes multiple hearings, and you're, you're done and over. So that aspect has been uh, pretty good. But so you're saying you just didn't want to work from home or you didn't get the, you, you needed like guidance or what have you? I mean, all of the above. It was like, I, I'm not going to try and Skype with my paralegal. Um, yeah. I don't work from home. It's home is my happy place, you know? Yeah. And I don't get into work mode when I have in, in until I commute, you know, somewhere between me stepping out the front door and getting at the office, there's a transformation that happens. Yeah. And um, I need that transformation. And, you know, I, that, I'm, uh, you've had Nick Ashley on your show. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, and, and I think this parallels in here and I, I, you're, you're, I imagine younger than me. I'm 50, just turned 50 not too long ago. You, you seem like you're, quite a bit younger. You're just you're having kids. So I'm glad to hear that you, and the reason I'm bringing Nick into this, he's kind of backed away from what he was doing, kind of the hard, harder stuff and, and kind of revamping his podcast. And I'm glad to see the young people with some perspective. And what I'm getting from you is you come home and that's your family. I mean, family is huge. And, and also just kind of your transformation out of where you were and you're kind of getting back to where you were from home. How was the family life and, and, reaction with uh, being a, an attorney as an example and are you balancing that well and, and and it sounds like so maybe you can lead me in and say yes Tyler you're correct that you're having a good work home life balance yeah I am I, I think that there are times when um, when Liberty weekly comes first when it probably shouldn't um, I'll be pretty open about that but I you know I I don't know what I don't know how much time other people are putting into their shows, but I put a lot of time into Liberty Weekly and it was nice to get a nine to five. And that was kind of why I took this job is because it's, it's a position where I don't have to take anything home. So at least being a, an attorney, I mean, you know, as a litigator, you probably found better balance, but I was, I mean, I was consumed by, you know, by work and it's just, you know, you could turn it off for periods of time, but it, it was always kind of being on call. Like the, my supervising attorney could call me at like seven o'clock and, and want something, you know, and I'd have to, you know, right. and, and so that was, yeah, yeah. Just uh, not a good setup, but now I think it's, it's a better balance. Uh, well, that's good. Yeah. I, as kind of what I do, um, I say, if, you know, unless it's something that my wife's going to be entertained by, don't give me a call on the weekend. It's really yeah. Family law, it's not really anything you need to be calling me on. Yeah. So no, I could tell with your um with your podcast and a lot of that you do a lot of work because it's not something you're just, you know, like Tower Gang or one of these would be much easier. We just phone up a friend and you guys just BS and it's, you know, the research is sending them the link to the show. Right. Uh, yeah. but you do a lot of work. So how much how many shows you're doing a week and then how much prep are you putting into thinking forward? So I've, I've tried to revamp this and, and I want to be clear. I don't want to shit on anyone who's doing their own project either. I I've just found in, it, it gets kind of like it does. I will admit it gets kind of frustrating because people do not want well-researched content. They don't want intellectual content. They want entertaining content. So if your intellectual content can be entertaining, like a James Corbett, that's really good. Yeah. Um, but what I've, really kind of wanted to do is from the start, I wanted my show to be well-researched. Um, but that takes weeks of preparation now. Like the Uyghur documentary, I easily put in 60 hours into that. Between all of the research and all of the editing and the voiceover and all that stuff. Um, but um, what I want to do is just do 
interviews and then put those out because I do a once a week show. I do interviews and put those out. And then every three or four weeks, I'll have an hour long documentary that drops or something like that is how I envision things happening. Uh, but then I started writing articles at, for the Institute and um, some some of them appeared on antiwar.com. And when your work appears on antiwar.com, that's pretty damn cool, at least yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. So I wanted to keep doing that. Um, so that's kind of what I've envisioned going forward. But I'm working on a documentary right now, and I try not to commit myself to pro to projects. Um, but I want to do it like uh, 10 times the government conducted medical experiments on their populace without their knowledge kind of thing. Uh, with a better title than that. So that's now, what I'm trying to think right now. First thing that comes up is there's 10. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. The oh, constant right. for days, man. Oh man. And so uh, you say people don't like some of the, how'd you put it? The, like educational podcasts that we were saying? I, well, I mean, I, I just, I don't want to sound like a curmudgeon here or anything like that. I just, I've found that people do not like uh, content that is too intellectual. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, I mean, like uh, to, to kind of fanboy on you a little bit, I, I do listen to you and Keith a lot because there's a lot of just, I, sometimes I just want to write to be entertained. And then I, I am like, no, I, this is not a, like, I listen to stuff while I'm working. That's just my brain. It kind of needs that white noise to kind of take some things, but sometimes it's yours. And specifically, it, it's not a podcast I do that with because, you know, kind of zone out and next thing, wait, I just missed a bunch of info. So I can't do that. So it's usually when I'm riding my bike or if we're doing yard work where my work is menial and then I could tune into you guys a little better and right. I do enjoy it. And it's very, um, very satisfying to, to take all that in. So I think there is a, maybe I'm your only audience. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, you know, and again, I maybe it's just that I suck and I don't get, you know, <laughs> no, no, but it's just like I, I don't know. It's um, if there's no way to say it without sounding like a little bitch, <laughs> you know. No, you're not. I'm I, so you're saying you're not getting the downloads of Dave Smith. I get it. I mean, you know, that's right. that's, uh, that's a tough haul to do. I imagine Dave is unique. Um, as I said, you know, I'm listening to him sometimes. And I'm like, in my mind, oh, how, how I'm going to you know, take on the subject. And then he does it better. And I'm like, okay, well, there's, you know, I think yeah. I'm a smart guy sometimes, but, you know, he, he does know his way around it. So um, well, it, it, it's just like, I mean, it, it's not a pure numbers game, but it's like, you know, I put out the Uyghur documentary and it has a thousand plays on YouTube. And it's like, it, it feels like it should have more than that. Right. I totally understand. And so I was going to ask how it's been doing. So. Uh, where all do you have that, that documentary? I think I have it on Odyssey and YouTube. Okay. So maybe one other place. I I read the, you had a post on it with, um, trying to see if, I don't remember if I actually, I don't think I saw the documentary, but I heard all your, um, your podcasts about it. And I think you had something on the Libertarian Institute as well, like a, a, a write-up article. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, so initially it was the article that I published and then I wanted okay. to make a documentary out of it. And, and what is, what is the feedback been from that? Cause, uh, when I first, I was kind of like everything else. And then, um, I think I saw your first podcast and you're like, you know, Tim pool piece of shit. Now you didn't say that, but yeah. you're, you're kind of like taking him on. I'm like, Oh, this is interesting because you know I trust a lot of the stuff that you guys put out. So I was really interested to hear, first of all, what made you think of kind of taking this on, and then um, what's been some of the negative uh, feedback, if you've got any? Um, so I was I was watching Tim Pool, and I was working on a different documentary that I never ended up releasing. But I was doing a documentary about COVID and the similarities to World War One propaganda, like COVID propaganda and World War One propaganda. And I was keying in for my research on this issue of uh, atrocity propaganda. So, you know, there's this piece, Falsehood in Wartime, that I, I covered with Keith, right. talking about all the stories that were told during World War I that ended up being lies. And so I just wanted to compare them side by side and tell people, hey, be careful about uh, COVID, you know, all the things you hear and see on the news. And um, Tim Poole had on, like, China Uncensored. It was like root 
Luke Rudkowski and then the guy with the beard who I don't know his name is uh, Jack Murphy. Yeah. Jack Murphy. And they were talking about how Uyghurs are being put into concentration camps and they're being rape tortured in large numbers. And um, I just got really suspicious about it. And then I pulled the thread and the, the thread kept pulling and pulling and pulling. So it was just an interest. I, I, and maybe that's the attorney side too, right? Is, which is, uh, you don't have to be a cynic, but being skeptical about everything. And sometimes it sounds too good. You know, that's one that I just kind of took in. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, Stephen Crowder talks about it. And, you know, all the right wingers are talking right. about it. Sure. I mean, that's kind of my more bent in a sense, you know, it's where I came from. Like, yeah, I, I probably believe that sounds, that sounds like what the Chinese are doing. So how were you able to do, because this is what it kind of got me is, how are we able to do the research? So you're over here, you got the internet. What's your ability to go and check some of these things? Um, and this is where my law degree has really helped. I think that it was, I really wanted to frame the issue first. And as a part of writing the article, I, of course, I had to look and see where all these things were being said first. So I, I went and I found all the mainstream media articles and sources talking about how China is committing genocide, and then I went and I I researched Mike Pompeo and his statements, and uh, Anthony Blinken, and uh, went during his confirmation hearings was talking about it and accusing the Chinese of doing this. And first, I looked at Bernard has the Moon of Alabama blog. He's kind of uh, I don't know if you know Moon of Alabama. I don't. He he's an independent blogger who covers um, foreign policy pretty extensively. And he had done a couple pieces about it. And that's where I got the majority of the checking the stories of these Uyghur um, eyewitnesses and these escapees. And I also, I went on YouTube and I saw this Nathan Rich video who he connected all the dots from the, um, what is it? The, the China Uncensored and how China Uncensored is Falun Gong basically. And how all the cast are Falun Gong and they work for Epic Times and New Tang Dynasty. Right. So, so those were the two major hit points. But then from there, I I pulled other threads. Like I, I followed the links in Bernard's articles. And I actually, I found a discrepancy that he made. So there were some things, but it was it was basically link farming. What? Hmm. Um, what do you think the, in, the, the reason was behind pushing this uh, Chinese Uyghur uh, genocide? I think there are several reasons, but I think the main overarching reason is this return to uh, renewed great power competition that the State Department is talking about. I think it, it's very clear um, to to those who kind of study this and look at it that the the administration's policy is to pursue great power competition. And I think the reason for it is that it's a, a return to the new Cold War, or it's, a, excuse me, rather, it's a return to the old cold war paradigm so now they're since the you know it seems like the the terror wars are ratcheting down a little bit but they need a new thing to justify their defense spending and uh, i think that this is going to serve them for a long time well you can even see that with back to the debate with crystal and uh scott horton you know i think uh crystal made the com or scott retorted back about um, you know, the issue in Taiwan, right? So, hey, we've suddenly, you know, we've got a big deal in Taiwan. That's going to be our next. Uh, so what do you think about their situation? And is that kind of feed into this? Uh, the, ta the Taiwan situation? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the Taiwan situation is going to be the centerpiece of this um, for, for the next, I don't know, few years at least. Um, and I, I think it... It's important because, you know, the United States is there. They have this canard about manu chip manufacturing and chip shortages. And I think it's a flashpoint because of the shipping in the South China Sea and the fact that you have this new, um, you have this new basic NATO Pacific forming. And I think it's the U.S., France, Australia, and maybe Japan. Dave DeCamp is going to kill me for this. That I can't remember who the who the countries are, but so they're forming these strategic alliances, and uh, Taiwan is is the flashpoint because there's so much international shipping there, and all these countries in the new quad they're calling it they they've been uh, taking their ships and sailing them through the you know up in the South China Sea, 
the U.S. has been doing these uh, freedom of navigation patrols, which is basically just cover for belligerents um, through the Strait of Taiwan. And I, I just, yeah, that's where all the opportunity is to kind of poke the panda. <laughs> poke the panda. Yeah. I like that. You know, uh, trying to remember, I think it was somewhere around 04, 05, maybe somewhere in that range. Um, U.S. Uh, China downed one of our planes. I don't know if you remember remembering this situation. Yeah, it was, you know, a big old a hubbaloo about that at the time. And you know, I was a good right winger, and that was just not going to be had. And I remember arguing with a guy at work at the time, and you know, he's just this is bullshit. Um, he wasn't buying the whole situation. You know, it's not as big a deal. And um, I look back now with it. it. It's interesting how you take. It depends if your guy. You know, George Bush was in power, so. You know, you're you're all defensive, and then the other side, anything that's happening, you know, that's Bush's fault that this guy got shot down. Right. It's just so, and this is kind of the the wonderfulness back to our libertarian stuff here about being able to just kind of remove yourself and say, what is the situation on the ground? What is the best for our country, rather than what's going to get my guy reelected, or is this going to look bad for him? So. Um, yeah, the, the Taiwanese thing. I mean, look, nothing looks good for Biden right now. But how do you think he is um, kind of just keep going on some um, foreign policy stuff? How do you think this his any reactions he's going to do right now with Taiwan um, is uh, basically pushed on by his how he handled the Taliban Afghanistan withdrawal? If that yeah, makes sense. I, I think it's an interesting interplay because I don't quite know where Biden stands on China. You know, like. Everyone calls him Beijing Biden, like right. everyone from the the right does, and, right. and Donald Trump. And and I do think that if you talk to people on the street about how they feel about Afghanistan, they it, now it's a foregone conclusion that we shouldn't have been there, and that we you know the war needs to come to an end. But they always throw in, but it was handled really bad, and you know all this kind of stuff, and it's right. it's actually kind of annoying. But um, I, I think he could. I don't I don't know, you know, what kind of pressures are are on Joe Biden, but I think he certainly could be feeling like he needs to posture. He he's made a lot of statements though directly calling China out and saying basically the next century will be defined by our competition with China. Um I don't think it necessarily bodes well. But then again, um there's so much happening with China and I think one of the important things to remember as all this bellicosity just kind of bubbles from the mainstream media is, is that I don't foresee China invading Taiwan because the, it'd be a, the largest invasion in world history. It'd be a bloodbath. The United States might get involved. I don't think they have that much to gain from invading Taiwan personally. And um, so I, and if you, the, the problem is, is that you read all of the, the news on it and you see, Oh, Chinese, planes are flying in Taiwanese airspace, uh, which is just a farce to begin with. But but in order to, to, to pick that out, you actually have to read the stuff and do some digging. Or you could just read Dave DeCamp. Okay. Or, or watch your, your video, I guess. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and so, I mean, I imagine part of the setup, because you see this with, you know, sarin gas and all these other situations is with a humanitarian issue. Not only are they attacking Taiwan, but, you know, the Uyghurs are being... Uh, genocided. I don't know how to say that. Or yeah. there's a genocide of them over there. So you know, it's a humanitarian reason to get involved as well. So, yeah, it is, and I I think it turns it turns the world against China in terms of uh, targeted sanctions and trying to cripple the industry of the Xinjiang region specifically. And it's all a destabilization campaign because um, I forget how many million. Um, Population of Xinjiang might be like twenty or thirty million, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, but there has been a protracted effort on behalf of the CIA to destabilize that region, uh, specifically be over the Uyghur issue because the Uyghurs, um, of course, that the conflict kind of goes back decades, if not centuries, and it, it's it's a foothold there. You already have Islamic terrorism in the Uyghur population. That's long established. And I think, um, I forget, Larry Wilkerson was talking, and I included him in my documentary just about the strategic importance of U.S. relations with the Uyghurs, um, you know, and how we've, they've been used, at least funneled through, through uh, into Syria, through Turkey, trained as Islamic jihadist forces, and I, just a sleeper cell situation. 
And I'm still trying to figure out how the whole withdrawing from Afghanistan plays into what could be a larger U.S. strategy in the region. Uh, that might be someone like Kyle Anselone or Joanne Leone or, you know, Dave DeCamp could tell you more about that. But um, it's important. So um, kind of I, I, this is one thing for me that's a, an interesting side. And uh, it, it goes back once again, I use Scott Horton uh, example, which is. Bill Crystal was kind trying to infer at one point that, uh, you know, his argument was really like, he didn't say it this way, but it's almost like it's pro Taliban, right? Pro the bad guy. Now, growing up, like I said, uh, being more on the right, you have all these wars, you know, it's really easy. Hitler bad, uh, you know, Tiananmen Square bad, right? Yeah. You know, Vietnam, it's all these bad, bad, bad. So it's so good to be on the other side. So then when I you know, the Vietnam thing between me was interesting. My dad had just missed it, but, you know, he had a bunch of friends that were over there. Um, and it's, you know, growing up, you're always like, you know, the, the damn dirty hippies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, then, and then all the left really was anti-war, but really in a kind of a, a Chairman Mao, their little red book that they always had type of way. And so I, suddenly when I found Scott and, and this whole movement, uh, I realized you can be a capitalist and against the war, which to me kind of blew my mind, right? Um so with that in mind, you have Tiananmen Square, you know, obviously the Chinese aren't good people. How do you pose these kind of situations best, uh, Afghanistan, any of these wars without ever, because I imagine you're not going to side with, that, with them at all, still emphasizing that they are the bad guy and yet the war is even the worst guy? Yeah, it's, it's a hard game to play because, and that's the most pushback that I've gotten from people about my documentary is, you know, calling me a genocide apologist yeah. and things like that. And I, I certainly, to that, I would say, you know, the burden of proof is an, an important thing. And in our Western system of law, we believe, you know, that people should be proven guilty um, or there should be a presumption of innocence and that the burden of proof is on people prosecuting the Chinese right. Communist Party. That being said, you know, of course, the human rights record in China is not particularly stellar. Um, so it is it is a hard, you know, kind of line to walk. But I think um, it, it's seeing those shades of gray that's important. And I think it's what sets out good li libertarians, uh, just people, good people in general on certain issues can see things with nuance and to examine the situation and, and see what everyone's motivation is at play uh, is, is really important. It, it's like, you know, when Scott in the debate with Bill, when, when Bill's like, well, what about, you know, all those Afghan women? Like, do you think that right. things are going to get better for them under the Taliban? And Scott's like, no, like what, what what's the point of that question? Yeah. Well, you said it would, I started kind of laugh there. You said, you know, good people could uh, make inferences about this, but that's, I mean, it reminds me of, you can't make arguments to so many people about uh, certain, like the Russia hoax with Trump without having to go, I did, I, I'm not for Trump, okay? So right, you, yeah. you, you can't even sometimes make those. So the good faith arguments uh, many times have gone out. And, you know, I've, uh, I think it's also, I just, and I hate to have to always emphasize, hey, these are the bad guys. But I mean, it even goes with the, the Israeli-Palestinian type of thing, which is like, I, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just not for, you know, da, 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 because that one gets really sticky. What's your, what you, you want to get in trouble and what's your views, <laughs> what's your views <laughs> on that? Well, on Israel, Palestine, I definitely, you know, with, not without qualification, but I support the Palestinians. I, I think it's clear what's happening over there is, is that they're in an open air prison camp. And the, I, this is not something I can speak on with authority. I have followed it, um, you know, but it, it certainly seems like a pretty straight issue. I, I was I was reading Coming to Palestine during the recent flare-up. I didn't oh. get a chance to finish it, but Sheldon Richmond makes a pretty good argument that the Palestinians are like the children of Israel who just converted and never left. They converted to Islam and are still living there. So, um, but on the other hand, too, I, I literally, I just had a conversation tonight with um, one of the detectives at the police department downtown. And um, he happens to be on the school board, too. So, um, but we were talking about that and somehow Afghanistan came up for some reason. And he was basically, you know, I was saying like, hey, you know that the people we supported were child rapists, right? And uh, he's like, I mean, he kind of said, well, like basically 
that's a different country and they have their own cultures and like we shouldn't say anything about it but he doesn't also apply that to the taliban and mm -hmm. and so it, it's like the the problem it's exactly right it's like well i say that you're supporting child rapists and he's saying well taliban will blow people up and cuts their heads off it's like okay well they can both be bad but right. what 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 is our presence going to do there you know and it, it's this whole thing that they do where they think that terrorism is something that's unique to islam and it, it's just yeah you know that's so interesting um like you know after 911 uh you know my whole thing and i remember i thought it was very persuasive at the time which was you know george bush saying you know we're going to spread democracy yes i mean i i was working at the time as a as, as a stockbroker i've had quite a few different uh and there was a guy that worked with me uh there and he was from uh iran and he was he was actually cheering on you know iran but um he was cheering on when uh, we pushed over the saddam's statute in you know uh, wherever it was at, at the time in, in iraq right uh, but my point was that I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to spread the thing. And I've come to realize that, you know, look, we can't even spread freedom in the U.S. right now. Yeah, It's a cultural thing, right? I mean, if they don't want it, they don't want it. And so the guy's oh, yeah, kind yeah. of somewhat correct about just it's not going to happen. You're not going to spread democracy over there. That's not what they are looking for. So we need to stop that kind of mindset. And, and for me at the time, you know, it's like what works great for me doesn't even work great for you in Wisconsin, let alone New York, let alone Iraq. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure your buddy, um, I'm pretty sure that Iraq was mostly Shia at the time, or it still is mostly Shia. So I, you know, it's the same reason Saudi Arabia got pissed off at us for launching Iraq war too. It's like you have a Sunni majority with a, a secular dictator, and then you just upset the entire balance of governance there uh, and empower the Shia majority. So just a little aside there, but no. And, and I, you know, I'm trying to, uh, there's so many times I want to like, and I'm trying to read Scott's book. It's pretty intensive. Uh, at least the first one, um, <clears throat> fool's errand. I think that's the first one he had there. And so the, the foreign policy stuff to me is still coming along, but if you're someone who you're, you're going to try to bring someone new into this, uh, this movement, what is anatomy of the state, the way to go? I mean, what's kind of the best, uh, way to go or to, to check out your podcast, I guess. Yeah, well, I, I'd always point people to that, I suppose. But um, I think it really depends on the individual. And I think it starts with the conversation and it starts um, asking them difficult questions. And if, if you know how they stand on things politically, you can attack them from their own position. I've So if you're doing like a Larkin Rose Candles in the Dark thing, that was effective against me. Someone who likes consistency and principles... Um, that's what I would do. But yeah, I mean, for, for someone who has libertarian leanings, I would, I would definitely suggest they read anatomy of the state. Um, doesn't Mary Ruart has a good book that I would give to leftists. And I can't remember, I don't know if you know, Mary Ruart at all. I don't. You remember the name of her book? I've not heard of her. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said. Oh, I'm sorry. I had I had not heard of her. Uh, healing our world in an age of aggression. I mm -hmm. think that would be maybe a good start for someone who's on the left. Um, and, and why is that? What do you think? I know. I know. Scott's always said Scott Horton. You know. Um. You know. Talk to the left from the left and the right from the right. Which I've really tried to to work out. You know. I told you I had this cycling podcast, and so I would. Yeah. I would, every once in a while, sneak some of these things in there. And, um, you know, especially here in California, it's more Northern California based. So there's a lot of uh, people <laughs> just butt up against all the time. Uh, but there was this issue a few years ago of this. Uh, it was actually last year. Uh, this kid was pulled over in Florida um, by the cops and it was body cam. It was just horrible situation. So I went at it from, you know, like, hey, cops, not so great. Uh, but trying to, hey, you know, the left always wants to just have more and more laws and da da da. And then the, and um, everyone I worked because everyone hated me. So, <laughs> but why is this book good for the left? Well, I think Mary Ruard comes at it from the left. I believe I could be wrong about this, but um, yeah, I, I I know that I've just heard from people. I haven't read it personally, so okay. don't uh, don't wed my name to this. Those of you listening, but um, I think Keith did an interview with her that I was very impressed by. So maybe I'll throw you the show notes to that article. I, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to keep that in there. On the right, who who would you give a book to on the right? 
What, well, for me personally, the one, um, Murray Rothbard's Anatomy of the State was great and for New Liberty, uh, you know, all his stuff, basically. I mean, I've gone through it all. To me, though, it was his, I think it was uh, for New Liberty, I think he had it. He's had this same comment in different ones, but it was the, the comment of, because I went minarchist, you know, right away. That was, matter of fact, I'll just tell you real quick. Um, yeah. I, had, I had Republican um, but always had you know strong libertarian leanings. Uh, then uh, the 2016 elections coming on. I'm more for Ted Cruz. You know, he's a smart um, uh, attorney. Actually, um, I had gone to school with his wife. We yeah. were friends in high school. So Heidi, nice. super nice. So I was like, hey, that's kind of my connection there. And then when he was kicked out, you know, basically didn't have a chance. I think it was after Ohio. I was like, screw it. I'd got my wife was a libertarian. I'm like, I'm going libertarian. And then I was minarchist and then boom, went to anarchist pretty quick. But it was the Murray Rothbard line of where he's hanging out with his buddies. They're all lefties. And they're basically like, so why, why is a little bit of government? Okay. You know, you want it for these kind of things, then why can't I have it for this? And to me, it blew me away. I'm just like, yeah, if you're going to be consistent, you know, you don't want to the, the right doesn't want to, uh, the drugs legalized or something. Well, why, why is that any better than you've got 30% taxes? You know, why is that number? Why are those things important and okay? And so for me, that was, that really did it for me. And so he's got an amazing way of, of writing the logic, especially anatomy of the state. Uh, I know different people find different things. And, you know, since then I've found uh, other things and, you know, podcasts have really been helpful for me too. I, re I remember I got chills when I read Anatomy of the State for the first time because it just, it made sense. And I was really captivated with this idea of, I think before I was an anarchist, I even said that property taxes were just you renting the land. So you never really own anything. Well, sorry to interrupt, uh, but yeah. think about it. You pay your house off. Do you still pay your property taxes? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I... I, I was really captivated. I, I, wa I watched a lot of Stefan Molyneux at the time. He really helped in like introduce me to these ideas. And I know he's controversial now, but um, he had this documentary, his a short video, the story of your enslavement. And I remember like I watched it. I don't know if you've seen it, but basically he, he does it. And it's like the way he narrates it is, is very kind of culty, but convincing, you know, but what he does is he, um, he goes through basically this theory in like a two minute video about how mankind has evolved and we developed farming from, from being nomadic people and we developed farming and that was really good. But then we developed human farming, which was creating a state. And for some reason, the whole concept of, of human farming being the most profitable business ever really kind of stuck with me. And so I was, I remember this thought, was the moment I, it kind of clicked for me. And, um, yeah, so that, that was the idea that won me over. Do you have, um, more or less, which side do you have more problems with when you talk about these? I mean, for me, it's, what's interesting is I'll have some of my buddies are lefties and then a lot of my family's righties and they seem to all argue against me and the, <laughs> the same yeah. exact situations about court and, and the police. And, uh, and so what, do you have any, um, success with either side. So courts and police and all that stuff, I have the least amount of success with the right. Uh, yeah. cause they just like law and order so much. Um, I get along with the right better cause I'm of the right. I mean, I, yeah. I have, I have, um, yeah, personal convictions that are more conservative, but, um, yeah. And I haven't, like my office mate right now is of the left and I've been able to have some success with him. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, what's interesting is, so a lot of my family's right. And, uh, you know, kind of libertarian leaning and, you know, free markets, big deal to them. And then I present these ideas as, cause to me, when I, when I finally found our oh, wait, you can be a capitalist and like no government it, it blew me away and it was exciting. Then that's when I was just gobbling everything up. And so I present this to them and they're immediately just pushing back. And I'm like, no, you're free market. You should be like trying to hook this line. <laughs> I don't get it. Um, and the left just seems to be, uh, you know, they're just not enough. They, they want to control it. So I just, I don't have, I don't have much success. Actually, I have like three friends that I really can kind of convince and they're, they're throwing themselves in this way. So it's been fun at least for that. 
Well, that's good. I mean, I in in law school, I had a very successful paper I wrote about free market solutions to domestic violence issues. And I talked about the uh, the Detroit Threat Management Center. And I was able to successfully pitch the idea that the state itself is just a bunch of good old boys. And that if we really wanted to protect women, we should have private security forces. <laughs> and actually people dug that in my class. So I could really, especially when you're taking on the issue of domestic violence. So I do a bunch of domestic violence restraining orders. I'd be I'm really sure. interested in that because, uh, you know, the whole idea of trying to come up with market solutions for the courts uh, to me is, is, is engaged. And I always think, oh, as an attorney, I should have all these. And I, I don't. I'm not necessarily a great designer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should um, have professional jurors is one of my opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It, it, what else do you have for the courts? Any other suggestions? Um, I mean, I, I think that we've already seen private arbitration do, you know, it, civil litigation is so expensive and time wasting right. and that I think, you know, all those solutions that the court has kind of integrated with uh, could be applied to a lot more issues, I think, but, yeah, professional jurors is something I, that I support. And then um, just kind of this idea that mostly it, it kind of goes with policing in general. It's like you could have private security forces do a lot of what police do. Uh, uh, Pete Quinones always says that police shouldn't come unless they're called. They should be like the fire department. Right. Um, yeah, so I think actually, police, go ahead. Well, I, was just, I think police can actually be the privatizing of police is almost an easier idea than, you know, the big thing they always say is, well, how are you going to get someone into court? What if they don't want to show up? Yeah. And, and, you know, those are some heat heady. And I always say, well, I think the market can supply, <laughs> supply it. Yeah. I think Kinsella had a good answer to this. And he said that you could, you could try someone in absentia. Um, and then I could even see this happening the way that title companies could help facilitate this is, is just, um, you know, you can't have a closing on a piece of real estate or it'd be really hard to do so without the title company doing something or, you know, hosting the closing or a bank hosting the closing. And it's just that those, you know, you can't register your deed unless it's cleared from liens and someone could try you in absentia and, uh, you know, attach a lien to your property or something like that, you know. How, how did, the, and, and I'll let you go here pretty soon. Um, how did the um, the moratorium and everything, you said you're doing some more property while you're working for a title company. How did that, uh, the moratorium on um, eviction, not evictions, but uh, the foreclosures, did that impact you guys at all? No, not really. Um, things have just been incredibly busy with us that, I mean, the market is just irrational, crazy right, right now. So um, haven't seen too much of that really. Um <laughs> I'm kind of, we dip ourselves into some, uh, like oh, here they call it the homeowner's bill of rights, which actually Kamala Harris ended up helping draft, yeah. uh, which helps, you know, the homeowners for evictions of uh, our foreclosures. Uh, and that business was <laughs> really drying up there until it let go. And then it's, it's taken off again. So, um, oh. you know, we have a, we have a housing issue, you know, I'm sure you've heard Clint uh, Russell Liberty lockdown talk about it with just, uh, housing prices are going crazy. And, you know, they always do in California, but it's even more so here. It, you have in that same phenomenon in Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah. And um, just crazy. Like we sold our last house after I left my last job and um, we got twice what we paid for it. And that was wow. that was partly like a savvy choice to buy the property. But I mean, it was crazy. We Our realtor thought that we priced it 60000 too high. And we had offers forty thousand above that. Well, good for you. Yeah, it was it was crazy. it was crazy. It was just insane. Well, um, anything you want to pitch or say before we uh, let you go? Yeah, well, you can check out my show libertyweekly.net. Otherwise, you can find me at the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org forward slash Patrick. And we're doing our annual fundraiser right now, which I mentioned before. But if you go libertarianinstitute.org forward slash donate, then you can help support the fine work that we're doing there. That's Scott Horton's Institute, but there's also other fine po podcasters and articles there as well. So thanks for, thanks for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on and, and people that want to learn a bunch of stuff. I mean, this is what you get with Patrick. Uh, go to check out his show, become a fan, uh, join his Patreon, help uh, his kids pay their bills. 
or him pay his kids' bills. <laughs> and uh, you're going to learn some things and you're going to help spread this knowledge out there to everybody else by doing so. So, Patrick, I really appreciate you coming on. I'll put the links to the show notes there and uh, many happy returns on your podcast. Thank you. Thank you.